title today is Good Enough Isn't. Has anybody ever heard that before? No? What, what comes to mind when you hear that? What? Mm-hmm. Right. So it's funny because this, um, years ago, years ago, when I first started working at Bank of America back in 99, um, I'm sorry, was that a laugh? <laughs> okay, Nyla, be careful. Anyway, when I first started at uh, Bank of America, it was this, you know, how they had those different posters on the wall, like teamwork, and they have like a little definition. And so this one poster said, good enough isn't. And that's all it said. And it just struck me. I'm like, what? Where's the rest of it? Good, good enough isn't what? But it's, it was sometime later that it really registered like, okay, I get it. Doing good enough isn't enough. And that translates over uh, really to these, uh, this lifestyle that we live that we've uh, accepted as believers. Um, <clears throat> so I am going to, well, I actually forgot to copy something. Give me just a second. Bear with me. decided to not function for me. Um, Armani, do we have the message as the one of the Bible verses, uh, versions? We do. Perfect. Okay. I know I didn't give it to you in advance. It's just a few. Uh, so I copied the others. For some reason, I didn't do this one. Can you find Philippians 3? Starting at the 12th verse, going through 14. That's Philippians 3. Actually, you can go through 16. Philippians 3, starting at 12, going through 16. And since I didn't copy it, I'm going to have to read from the screen. All right, so it says, I'm not saying that I have all this together. And let me stop right there. Let me, let me back up. So this is uh, Brother Paul, um, if I remember correctly, uh, writing to the church. Um, so just bear in mind that this is a man that's, you know, held in some regard. You know, this is a man that has actually written some books in the Bible. And this is him conveying this message to the church that he's writing to. So it says, I'm not saying that I have this all together, that I have it made, but I am well on my way reaching out for Christ who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this, but I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning. Us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. So let's keep focus on that goal, those of us who want everything God has for us. If any of you have something else in mind, something less then total commitment, God will clear your blurred vision. You'll see it yet. Now that we're on the right track, let's stay on it. So just in reading that, you know, it kind of, um, it's kind of bothering me so much, sorry. It, it puts me in the mindset of, realizing that 
although I may call myself a follower of Christ, I still have work to do. Right? right? Amen. So you can correlate that to uh, being pruned. Can somebody give me a definition of what they believe pruning is? things absolutely absolutely that's exactly it it's uh, it's to cut off those dead things uh, to promote growth um, even though a lot of times the thought of pruning um, kind of brings up a, an idea or it gives an association of punishment but we as believers have to realize that it's not a punishment but it's actually done to improve uh, how we operate in, in our growth. So um, one piece that I found in, in looking, uh, looking up some pruning, uh, this is nothing out of the Bible, but I believe this is just a, uh, just a quote that I found online. It says, God is the vine dresser who prunes the life of everyone who abides in Christ and bears the fruit of Christ. Spiritual pruning enhances spiritual growth by removing whatever inhibits or stops spiritual growth. So um, it should be an encouraging thing when we have to be pruned because there's an opportunity for dead things that are on us to be cut and the things that are alive that should be um, in order to produce fruit gets an opportunity to grow. So in John 15 and 2, Jesus is talking here, and he says, um, and, and just by the way, I'll, I'll be jumping back and forth between the Message Bible and some King James, some might be NIV, so um, it, it may read different than what you have. But John 15 and 2 says, I am the real vine, and my father is the farmer. He cuts off every branch of me that doesn't bear grapes. And so that in itself is saying that God is looking for fruit in us. And Pastor even recently talked about the fig tree and how Jesus cursed it because it didn't produce the fruit, right? And so it continues and says, and every branch that is grape bearing, he prunes it back so that it will bear even more. So that itself struck me and the fact that the pruning, oh, the pruning is done so that even more can be produced, right? And so, you know, it kind of put me in the thought of, uh, you know, I'm just trying to relate this whole thing uh, to my personal situation, and it made me think of my daughter, right? So, you know, Angel went through... Uh, I guess you could call it a pruning process during her teenage years, right? So plenty of times where she was made to go to church where she didn't want to go, right? And all those times we told her, no, you can't go here. No, you can't go there. And looking at that, that was really a pruning process. And even though we had no idea of what the whole pruning process was gearing up for, you look at where we are now. And here she is doing what? Bearing even more. Right? You understand it? So it was a multiplication that was in the process even then. But that pruning had to trim her and shape her into where she is now. So that when she does eventually give birth to these babies, they have some sort of foundation. Because had not some pruning taken place, in her younger years, who knows, you know, which path she would have taken, you know what I'm saying, and what might have happened from there. And so let's uh, jump on to James 1, all right? Um, and you don't have to worry about the scripture, Armani. I copied the rest of these. Uh, All 
All right, so James 1, and start around the second verse. So it said, consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. That's enough to stop right there. <laughs> like, a gift? Really, that's a gift when tests and challenges come at you? Uh, okay, all right, that's, that's what it says, right? So we... We're going to take it and run with it. So, you know that under pressure, your faith life is being forced into the open and shows its true colors. So, don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so that you become mature and well-developed and not deficient in any way. Man, when I tell you that, slap me all kinds of ways. I mean, because... That's almost the natural human response, right? I'm in a bind. I'm in a situation. Let me find a way to get out of here. Make it easier on myself. But this is saying that consider it a gift when these tests and challenges come at you because it's basically an opportunity for your faith to grow, right? And so and the, the end of that, again, kind of stuck out to me because it said, um, let it do its work so that you become mature and well-developed and not deficient in any way. And so if we call ourselves Christ followers, we can't afford to have faith deficiency. Because that's really the whole basis of faith, right? Is believing. And so as believers, we can't allow ourselves to be faith deficient. Otherwise, we're just wearing a title. All right. So, let's jump down to uh, James 1.19. Uh, well, starting at 19. It's, this honestly was, this is, if I have a favorite scripture, I think this one is it. Um, because once upon a time, I was that hot head. Didn't take much to blow my top, like, it just, it really didn't take much. I know y'all probably looked at me like, what? What? John? Yeah. Yeah. We're not talking about driving, okay? That's, that's different. That's different. And even in that, I, I'm, I'm changing. I'm changing. Listen, okay. So if you're driving... Right. And you in one of those situations where your life is about to flash before your eyes, you have to make a sudden move or break suddenly or somebody almost hits you. It's a natural reaction to react. Right. <laughs> right. So all I'm saying is the last time I got in one of those situations, which is about maybe about a month ago, <laughs> so I had to react, you know, whereas normally some, uh, you know, some words might fly out, some words that I probably wouldn't say in here right now. Y'all get what I'm saying? When, when that situation happened to me, before I even realized it, instead of saying what I would normally say, all I could let out was a Jesus. And so that, as minor as it is, that's growth. That's growth for me. And I mean, it was so, it was like so, like, you know, bang, bang, like I didn't even have time to think to where, you know, after I got out of that situation I was driving, I'm like, Okay, God, um, I guess I do have a little bit of something in me, you know, that, that that was my first response versus blowing off. So, anyway, let's get back on track now. All right, so, again, this, this here was my favorite scripture, and I was prefacing all that to say that um, when I first found this scripture, just read it, like it just really 
resonated with me had changed the way uh, that I handled some things. So it says, dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Like I said, when I, when I found that, it just really, really kind of checked me, you know what I mean? Because it's really letting us know that we have control. We really have more control than what we operate in a lot of times. And so, you know, sometimes I'm sure my kids probably, you know, don't necessarily like it, but sometimes they may come to me with a question about something. And my number one response is, let me think about it. Hold on. Because that scripture, again, it, it worked on me so that I'm slow to speak. You know, I'm not just going to just give you a fast answer. I want to think about this thing before I respond. And that even translates, you know, beyond just with the kids, but just in general. All right, so just skipping on to uh, verse 20. Well, I'm going to go back and read 19 and continue to read. So it says, dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. All right? So throw away all spoiled virtue and cancerous evil in the garbage. In simple, humi in simple humility, let our gardener, God, landscape you with the word, making a salvation garden of your life. So here we are again uh, with the vision of God being the gardener and shaping us into who he would have us to be. All right. So I am almost done here. Um, but y'all know back in the day, you know, in church, when somebody would get up and read a scripture, at the end of the scripture, do y'all remember hearing what people would say at the end? Huh? That, that's exactly what it sounded like. It was, it was, it was like, what? What are you saying? But no, did anybody remember hearing that? Right. So, so it was something along the lines of, may the Lord add a blessing to the hearers and the doers of the word. I was like, it, it still didn't make sense to me. Like, even reading it, like, okay, the blessing and the doers of the What? So, but now in reading some additional scriptures, now it makes sense, right? So, in James 1, 22 through 24... It says, don't fool yourself into thinking that you are a listener when you are anything but. Letting the word go in one ear and out the other. Act on what you hear. Those who hear and don't act are like those who glance in the mirror, walk away two minutes later having no idea who they are and what they look like. So I'm like, okay, it makes sense now. Because I'm hearing the word being read from this person that's standing up reading the Bible, but it's not enough to just hear it. Now I have to actually put it in action. And I shouldn't just sit there and let it go in one ear and out the other because other, why am I even there? You know what I'm saying? So, um, and again in James, this is uh, still along those same, line, same lines in James 2, 14 through 17. It says, dear friends, do you think you'll get anywhere in this if you learn all the right words but never do anything? Does merely talking about faith indicate that a person really has it? I'm going to pause there for a second. This is still talking about the hearing and the doing. We can talk all day about I have faith, I believe, I believe. But what are your actions doing? If you're not carrying out any actions, you're basically just blowing hot air, really. I mean, sorry to put it like that, but that's the truth of the matter, right? So continuing on, it says, for instance, you came up on an old friend dressed in rags and half-starved and say, good morning, friend. 
be clothed in Christ, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and walk off without providing so much as a coat or a cup of a coat or a cup of soup. So where does that get you? Isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? As y'all can tell, this is the message Bible. <laughs> it's straight to the point. Having faith and doing things out of tradition without really, how can I phrase this? I put it like this. You can't just talk about it. You have to be about it. Basically, that's the easiest way I can put it. You have to be about it, all right? So, I mean, even, you know, when we look at where we are now in this building, you know, Pastor had to have faith that we would have our own building, right? And what did he do? He wrote out the vision. He believed, right? And you know it was faith because if you ask Pastor, hey, how is this going to happen? What are we going to do about this? When is this going to happen? What was his response? I don't know. I don't know. And so that just reiterates how much he relied on his faith to, for the action to happen, right? So he had the faith that it would be, uh, that it would come to pass, but he also had to put in some action, whether that was assembling the finance committee and telling them, hey, this is our vision, this is what we want to do, talking to the board members, putting stuff in place, right? He didn't just talk about this is what we want to do, because if he just talked about it, we would still be in that storefront, busting out the seams. All right? So. All right. And I'm coming up to the last couple of points I want to make. Had anybody ever heard of that once save, always save? What's your... What's your thought about that? I don't, I don't want to get somebody input. If saved, always save. If saved, always save. Okay. Okay. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. No, 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 you good, you good. I, uh, I brought that up for a specific reason because usually that topic brings about a little controversy. You know, just difference of opinions, difference of interpretation. But I'm going to share with you what I believe uh, was revealed to me about that, all right? <clears throat> so this is Romans 10 and 9 is where this is uh, based out of, right? 
So it says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Huh. Saved from what? What I think happens is we lose sight of the word tense used here. All right? If you believe, I'm just going to kind of short, shorten this, right? If you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Will be implies future tense. And so what I believe happens is we take, we lose the tense of that word, the, the, the real context of it. So that's the equivalent of saying, um, I'm going to try to come up with a, a parallel here. Um, I reach into my pocket and I give my daughter my keys, right? So she now has my keys. And so I'm telling you, you can drive my Jeep, right? So she goes out there to drive it, but she can't drive it. It's just a stick. She don't know how to drive a stick, right? But I'm telling her, I'm giving you my keys. You can go. But the fact is, she can't actually put into motion what I've given her access to because that time hasn't come, right? So basically, all in all, I hope I'm not confusing anybody with what I'm saying. Um, just to put it in perspective, you confess that you believe that Jesus died for your sins and was raised. Okay, now that you believe that, you've accepted this lifestyle. You've accepted him as your Lord and Savior. You've accepted his teachings. You now have a race to run. Okay, once you faithfully carry out what's been presented to you, then at the end of this life, you will be saved from the gates of hell. Is that making sense? Okay. So uh, let me continue on with this. So basically here, what we're looking at is that bearing no fruit, because again, remember, we were talking about the vineyard earlier and being pruned, or bearing bad fruit leads to being cut off. Okay. But those who believe, not only believe, but actually do the work, will be saved. Okay, so we still have work to be done in order to be saved. Now, I am on my way to being saved, and I can speak it, you know, yes, I am saved, but I have to understand that by me saying that I am saved doesn't mean that I can just do whatever and have no consequences behind it. Is that...